We have people joining right now. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks everybody for, for joining just... us. Good, Alex. No, I was just gonna say for those of you who just joined, we'll get started in about 30 seconds. Just wanted to mention for those of you who are joining that um, if you have a question, feel free to add that to the, the chat box on the bottom here. We're happy to take questions during the presentation. Yep, and the QA functionality built on the platform is the best place to put that question, but we'll also also look at chat. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to have you here today for Michael and Mai's webinar talk on data career tips with Alex and Michael, me being Alex and Michael being Michael. So I always like to start these with a quick introduction, just so you know who I am and what my background is. So my name is Alex Christensen. I am a career data and analytics software trainer. I've been doing this for about 10 years now. I'm also one of the three partners and co-founders of Tessellation, which is a boutique uh, data and analytics consultancy, and data, data Coach, which is an analytics enablement tool, platform, and program uh, that we use uh, here every day. And Michael is part of my Data Coach team. So currently, my responsibilities are to oversee Data Coach for all of our clients across the world. Um, and uh, just also related to this, that's also related to this conversation. I'm also the executive sponsor for Tessellation's internal early career program, where we work with people who are either new to data analytics or new to consulting. And I work with them to help them skill up and become excellent data and analytics consultants. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Green. Uh, you might have seen me on LinkedIn writing under the hashtags of data coach, uh, breaking into data science. I have a background starting in mechanical engineering, but then moving into analytics data science over the last few years. So I've really enjoyed the journey. Looking forward to talking with you about that today. But I've had the priv privilege and uh, the, the joy of working with Alex and his team at Tessellation for about a year, almost a year and a half now. Uh, so I'm a principal consultant here. Uh, some of my job is delivering solutions to clients, but a lot of my job is coaching. So I am responsible for a coaching team here. We provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring, uh, practical problem-solving help with people who are learning to upskill in different tools, analytics tools that we'll mention later today. Uh, and also I work with an analyst team here whose job is uh, largely to either deliver solutions to clients and or to upskill themselves using our data coach program here. Um, so again, it's a great uh, privilege to meet you guys today. Thank you for logging in. We'll talk a, a full range of topics today about data careers. Why don't you kick us off, Alex? So yeah, so just give a little context. Uh, met, uh, Michael mentioned this at the beginning, but I've seen uh, we've had a couple more people join. We really want this to be an open conversation with the community. Um, you can use both the Q&A and the chat functionality to send us questions. Michael and I will start this out by asking each other a couple questions just to get the conversation started. But we really do hope that everyone on this, uh, on this call submits the questions you have about uh, data and analytics careers, about the industry, about what Michael and I do, because um, that really is our goal. Um, again, we'll start with a couple questions and then we'll very quickly much quicker than a normal webinar, open it to questions for the group. 
So a couple of the things that we do hope to enlighten the group on today is just on advice about um, how we got our first jobs in data and analytics, um, but also kind of what we see within the community. Both Michael and I are part of the hiring team at here at Tessellation Data Coach. How do you strategically upskill um, in this field? And how do you really talk with uh, people about those skills that you have? How do you pick the right tool to learn? How do you network? And uh, how do you become a thought leader within the data analytics space? Now, I will say I don't consider myself a thought leader in the data analytics space. That is definitely Michael, um, and he's a great resource to talk to about that. But you are as well, you're being modest. Um, so uh, really, it, this is an ask us anything. Um, so if you're familiar with AMAs um, in Reddit, that is kind of what in, inspired this talk. And I've already seen a question come in. I'm excited to take a look at that in a moment. But to kick it off, Michael, um, how did you get your first job in data and analytics? Yeah, absolutely. I love this conversation topic. It's one of my favorites, actually, because it really defines the course of a, a lot of your life. What career you have, what job you have, do you enjoy your work? Does it feel fulfilling to you? Do you feel like you're making a mark on the world? And those are things that I care about, and I think a lot of people care about. So how did I get started? Well, it started with just passion, just interest, knowing that I wanted to do more with numbers, with computers, uh, and wanted to work with people who love data as well. So I started off in a very non-traditional route. Actually, in college, I was studying political science. And then mid-college, I changed my major to mechanical engineering because I wanted to solve technical problems. I just didn't know which ones. So I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. And then I started working at Michelin, a great company, designing tires. And what I discovered was the thing that I loved most about the job was actually analyzing the data uh, behind the tire designs. And so how, how do I analyze data from manufacturing, from uh, technical you know, engineering design uh, concepts and, and use math to my advantage? So when I started thinking through how do I make data a more prominent role in my job, in my career, I started thinking through, well, who's going to hire me as an engineer to do a data, whether analytics or data science job? Uh, so I went through a couple of years of this uh, this thought process of how, how do I position myself as an expert in data when I really haven't got the job yet. Um, so that's what we'll talk in detail in, in a moment here. But I got a couple of different roles. I'd say they were stepping stone jobs. They were little bits of, of progress towards full-time analytics and data science roles. Uh, starting with, I worked for a supply chain company as an analytics manager. And that was kind of a hybrid role of being kind of a business expert and kind of doing uh, analytics with Altrix, Tableau, R, and other tools that we'll talk about today. Uh, then I moved into a role at Data Robot, uh, where I was focused more on the machine learning side of things, so using the Data Robot platform to actually solve data science problems. Uh, and then I moved over here to Tessellation, where I have the opportunity to help people who are upskilling solve the same kinds of analytics problems, whether it's with Altrix, Tableau, uh, Azure ML, what have you, uh, different tools that allow you to answer questions with data. So why did I do this? How did I do it? Well, it started with passion, something that I wanted to learn. I didn't really know where I wanted to go with it, but I knew that I needed to upskill. So I just started trying stuff out, uh, trying a little bit of open source programming with R, and then doing a couple projects that led to interviews with companies and just telling them about the things I was working on. And one thing led to the next over a period of years. And then looking back, I've really enjoyed the, the journey of several different roles now in the data world. Um, and by the way, Alex, I'd love to ask the same question to you. How did you get involved in data and what interests you most about it? Yeah, it, how I got my first job in data, uh, I always look at it as a happy accident. So I also come from a, a non-traditional background. Uh, I went to school to be a biological anthropologist and an archaeologist. So literally studying the bones of human ancestors and the bones of the animals who ate us. Um, so kind of a hybrid between Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park. Um, but I, I got a minor in computer science because my dream job uh, when I was in school, not my dream job now, was to be an IT person on the field at an archaeology site. So doing things like geographical information systems, um, doing uh, 3D mapping of artifacts, that was my dream that job at the time. Well, uh, I graduated during the recession. And there was no way 
that that, that was going to be happening. Universities weren't funding projects like that. Uh, private sectors, uh, not even private sectors, like state governments do have those roles, but they weren't expanding at the time. So I had a pivot. Um, and I got a job as an account manager at a uh, small uh, telecommunication software company. And there I was hired to be the account manager. So literally just call the clients and, um, and make sure everything's going all right with them. But one thing that I'm really, really grateful that that job had on day one was read and write access to their Microsoft SQL Server database mm -hmm. and their DB2 database. So I sat down on my first week there. At this point, I knew Java. I didn't know any data and analytics languages like, like R, Python, or SQL. And I just sat down with the SQL textbook, and I absolutely fell in love with what I was doing there. So um, within about three months of that, I was uh, doing migrations from um, uh, legacy databases to new databases. And then about three months after that, I started working as a uh, internal trainer on SQL. And that's when I fell in love with data and analytics software training. Um, and then I just started a career. I, I pivoted to a small boutique uh, uh, data and analytics firm to do consulting, worked at some big shops, and then three, a little over three years ago, uh, decided to start this company because I thought that we could better serve both our customers and our trainees with, with our methodology. So, excuse me, that's a little bit about how I got here. Awesome. All right, so we have our first question has come in from Matt Diamond. Uh, he asked, should anything particular be kept in mind when transitioning to data science mid-career? Is the barrier to entry any higher due to prior non-data science experience? Mm. Great question. And by the way, I just want to say something I love about Alex's journey, both a huge career pivot, but also entrepreneurship. So there's just so much opportunity in the space. I'm so glad he did start Tessellation. It's a great place to work, by the way. <laughs> if you like. I'll, uh, I'll start answering this question and then Please if you'd do. like to add something to it. Actually, Matt, I think that this is a great asset to you to be able to start mid-career. So do you belong in data if you're early career? Yes. Do you belong in data if you're mid-career? Yes. Late career? Yes. Because there's so many ways that you can go about it and there's so many industries that need data analytics or data science professionals. And many of those industries will only accept people who already have prior experience in that domain. So I would say if you're looking to just apply to generic entry level analyst roles, then well, no, your, your career experience isn't going to help you there. But if you're looking to really leverage your experience and actually impact a domain that you care about with analytics, then you are the prime candidate to do that. So I would say, I, I thought the same thing when I started, hey, I've gotten on this track where I'm, I'm on the path to being an engineer my whole life, um, but I really wanna do data, how do I switch? And the answer was, I didn't actually have to switch. I more kind of had to take stepping stones that leveraged my background in engineering, plus my newfound skills in data and gave me something, uh, a hybrid of both that actually was really marketable. I think you're, you'll find that a lot of the time when people are transitioning into data, and by the way, it's a lot of non-traditional experience of people coming into data. It's a really hot field that people want to come into. And a lot of people leverage their experience in their prior career uh, to really make themselves the best candidate for certain companies, certain industries that are looking only for people just like them. So I would say, Matt, do not be afraid about the mid-career question. It's actually the perfect time to break into data. Uh, I'd say there's a number of things to think about there, uh, pay, experience level, all the, and really you can make it work. I've seen many people make it work, both in terms of how do we make sure that at my level of my career, like I, I'm not doing something like starting from ground zero. Well, in fact, you really can uh, make a good, uh, uh, interesting, fun, potentially well-paid uh, transition into data, uh, given your prior experience. And Alex, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I have a couple things to add. Um, and, and I see that Matt sends a follow up. I'll read that in just in just a second. Um, the big thing that I look at when we're looking to staff or hire data scientists is that business experience. And that is invaluable to, uh, to companies when they need to actually have a data scientist on the team. And it, it applies for data analysts as well. 
that is the, the thing that is usually missing. It doesn't matter how technical or well-written your model is. If you don't know how it can benefit a business or an industry, it's meaningless. So many data science models just never go from um, kind of the sandbox environment to the production environment. And I would say the large problem with that is that they just don't really understand what uh, the business actually needs, how the business works. That is the single biggest gap that I see in the market when hiring data scientists. Yeah, there's all these great, really smart people with all the technical skills coming out of these master's programs. And great, like we hire people like that. But we know when we hire people like that, that they don't have the business experience and we can't actually put them solo on a data science project. Because if you can't leverage that experience, it's just, uh, it's not the best work that you'd be doing. Now, kind of the interesting thing is um, uh, small shops, in my experience, both consultancies and in industry, get that. They understand that it is more than just years of experience um, with Python or R or, or modeling. Larger organizations, there tends to be a little bit of a barrier just to get in the door to do the interview. So um, I still think everything I said still applies, but I do think those small and the medium shops tend to be a little bit more forgiving um, for people who are pivoting because they know and will recognize kind of the value of that business experience, e even if you're newer as a data scientist. Mm. So um, Matt's follow-up question was, so then is it logical to believe that a data role in my current industry finance is necessary before transitioning to a different industry? I don't know if it's necessary, but I, I do think it would be easier. Absolutely. I would agree with that. And, and actually just a quick anecdote here. So like when I went from an engineering and somewhat supply chain related role, and I got my first analytics role, the way I convinced them to hire me was, hey, I've got experience with product development, with manufacturing, with supply chain. And I just also happen to have a lot of interest in data and a lot of these newfound skills. And I know how to build projects that will actually solve real problems that I deal with today. Um, so like an easy stepping stone is leverage your experience for a first data role that's in that domain. And then next, once you've got that first data role, you can really go to any vertical you want to. I think is what you're saying. It's really the path of least resistance for a lot of people. I've done that. A lot of people have done that. All right, let's move on to our next question. Um, so Eric, hi Eric, great to talk to you again. Um, do you think it's better for early career data professionals to explore a specific domain expertise or is it better to understand a breadth of topics? Mm. I'll, like to I'll go, take a yeah, go, go ahead, go first. I think to some extent both. And here's why I say this. Um, when you're starting out in data, so you, you may or may not come from a, a, a career background that's unrelated to data. Maybe you're a new grad, maybe you've got some career experience. Either way, right? You're still stepping into a potentially full-time data role, right? What do you like? What do you want to spend the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your life doing? You may not know. You may want to start a little bit broad just to understand, hey, do I like autom uh, ro robotic process automation? Do I like building dashboards? Uh, automated data prep workflows? They're like building machine learning models, uh, you know, computer vision, like <laughs> there's just so many things you can do. You may want to start studying broadly just so that you're kind of exposed to it all and you know what's what's out there. But then I think when you start wanting to really get your first full-time role, you're going to have to narrow down a little bit because people are not just looking to hire like complete generalists. Yes, they want people that are well-rounded, but whenever you're going for a job, they have something in mind, something that they want a skill that you bring to the table, uh, a way of thinking that you bring to the table, experiences maybe that you bring to the table. And so if you can hone in on what like new, like nuanced, um, narrowed focused genre of jobs that you actually are going for, then I would laser focus on that, but only after you've gotten a well-rounded picture of what's out there and you know you wanna focus on that genre of jobs. What would you say there, Alex? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And kind of how I think about it is there's a couple of different things. Think about what you're interested in, because the industry needs both. Um, think about what are you interested in and what type of company do you want to work for? And I'll, let me elaborate on both of those. Mm. The, the smaller the company, or even the smaller the department, if we're looking at a large company, because it can exist within a large company, 
the more breadth of experience you're going to need to be successful in data and analytics. Um, and breadth always comes at expense of, of depth. I've always thought of myself as a breadth person. Like I know a little bit about everything, all major tools within data and analytics. And that has served me well for certain types of projects. Like it's been very helpful to go in and do installation of tools. It's been very helpful to do strategy consulting engagements. It's been very helpful to do architecture. It's been very helpful to do training. I think if those are the things that you want to focus on, particularly in small to medium sized companies, breadth is most important. That's, that's what you need to be successful because you're going to be on a team of one, two, three, four, five. So everyone's going to have to know a little bit of something to do. Now, if depth is your interest, it's not mine personally, but there's as many people who are interested in going deep in one tool. I think about one of my, uh, my co-partners, Luke Stink, he is a Tableau Zen master. He literally made the conscious decision one day to go as deep as possible in Tableau because there, there are needs for that. Um, so he is seen uh, as an industry leader in Tableau. People come to him and want to work with him because of that depth and, that he has and the, the demonstrated thought leadership. You see that a lot at larger companies as well. You're gonna be more uh, specialized into a single role. You, whereas a medium company, you might have to do a little bit of Snowflake, a little bit of Tableau, a little bit of Power BI, a little bit of Alteryx to get by. At a large company, yeah, those roles exist, but for the most part, you're probably gonna be a Tableau person, an Alteryx person, a, a, a Snowflake person. And you just have to think about what do I want? Um, do I want to go deep and be one of the best people in the world at this tool, or do I want to focus on learning and, and uh, have a wider breadth of, of things? And that will influence the types of jobs and the types of projects and the types of companies that they'll be looking for a resource like you. Awesome. And one thing there, excellent shout out there to like, what do you really want? What kind of size of company? What kind of industry? What kind of product if, if it's a product related company? Like all those questions can refine how you set yourself up to make that transition and, and get that role. And, and it's it's vast, there's so many differences. Um, in, in fact, if you don't mind, Alex, I'll, I'll open up with this next question. Vibob says, for someone who's only worked with Excel before, what would be a good next step? SQL or other low code uh, business intelligence tools like Power BI and Tableau? And I think that goes hand in hand again with where do you wanna end up? I think that an important exercise when you're just starting out is study the people around you in the community of data, right? So I spent a lot of time a few years ago on LinkedIn, just connecting with people, just kind of reading their profiles, seeing what they do for their jobs. Do, you know, is that something that I would enjoy? And based on those people and where they were, what experiences led them to that role? What was it industry experience? What tools have they used? And so in a lot of cases, Excel is the gateway to all other analytics and data science. And the, the question would be, well, do I wanna go like a low code analytics tool route, Power BI, Tableau, Alteryx? For many people, the answer is yes. Do I wanna go strictly SQL or R or Python coding? Um, do I wanna go to more auto ML tools? And that would again, depend on what you're interested in. But what I will say is this, use Excel until you can't anymore. If you need to automate, scale up, do more complex analysis. Um, low code tools, which are really easy to pick up like Power BI, like Alteryx, like Tableau. Uh, and then even SQL is very basic programming. That's pretty easy to pick up too. I'd say you can't go wrong. Again, just keep in mind, what kind of, what kind of problems do you wanna solve? What kind of industries do you want to be a part of as you're working with data? And in many cases, you'll find that people, if you find them on LinkedIn or otherwise, people working in those roles in those industries, in many cases, they are using some of those same tools. And you start to connect with those people and see what you have in common. Um, go ahead, Alex, if you have some ideas here as well. Yeah, so th this is something I think about a lot um, when people ask about, about career advice or for what they should learn next. And the guidance that I always have is at a company, for every 10 people you have working as um, business intelligence engineers, so analysts, so people using a Tableau, a Power BI, or even an Alteryx, you have, for every 10 of those that you have, you maybe have five SQL developers or data prep specialists, and then you probably have one to two data scientists within that group. The reason I think that breakdown is important is 
um, companies have a much, much harder time filling all of the seats for analysts using mm -hmm. Power BI and Tableau than they do for SQL developers, and then even more than they do for, for uh, data scientists. That said, all of these are some of the hottest jobs um, on the market right now. So don't get the impression that, that you can't get hired in, in, in any of those. But I think it's important to remember that, that there are always going to be way more openings within kind of the, the business intelligence analyst space than there is going to be within the SQL or even the data science space. So mm -hmm. the reason I focus on this is I do think, um, and I'm going to probably mention um, kind of the, the grad programs that do business intelligence and analytics a lot lately. I think they do a great job of teaching the technical skills um, for both like SQL developers and uh, data, aspiring data scientists. They do a disservice, in my opinion, to people who will, will be true analysts. Because from an academic perspective, they're knocking it out of park. But from a practical perspective, things like Power BI and Tableau tend to be a footnote in those trainings, not all of them, but a lot of them. And that's really what the industry needs um, more than anything else. Now, yeah. um, if you're saying of, of these three tools you mentioned, Tableau, Power BI, SQL, what should I learn? I would say Power BI. Um, Tableau is not going anywhere. SQL is not going anywhere. There is a huge gap for, for Power BI developers um, in this country right now and across the world. Um, Microsoft is taking a huge market share out of, uh, away from Tableau. Again, Tableau is not going anywhere, but there are a lot of companies who are transitioning from Tableau to Power BI. A lot of new companies are going on to Power BI. Uh, and then, uh, and then it comes down to price. Um, it, there's a perceived um, lower cost for Power BI, and we could debate if that's actually the case, but the truth is if a shop is already on the Microsoft stack, it's only $10 a month to add additional people to Power BI Pro. So, and both are great tools, don't get me wrong. I love using both tools, but if you had to choose one thing to focus on because you really wanted to get in data and analytics, I would focus on Power BI personally. Mm. And I think also, I'd just like to touch on like the tools that you choose to learn, they're also related to the, the job market that you wanna compete with. So I've actually fluctuated back and forth between traditional analytics and more like hardcore data science, right? So I started as a, more of an analyst, then I went into more of a data science role. And now I'm kind of in a hybrid role where I kind of tackle both sides of the coin. And I feel like there's, there, there's a lopsided job market today where like so many people train uh, to be hardcore data scientists with really deep Python programming skills. And as Alex mentioned, that there's, there's jobs for that, but there are not as many. As, there's literally millions of people graduating every semester with, with those, of those skills. And then over here, there, there's not as many course, courses or, or just like awareness of, hey, if you can train up on Power BI, Altrix, Tableau, um, SQL, like these that are considered more like the analytics side of thing, there's actually a huge amount of jobs, as, as Alex mentioned. So I think just consider both what you want to do short and long term, but also who you want to be competing with. I don't think it's a good idea to start with no data experience, take just a master's in data science and immediately apply to a senior data scientist role. I think the ratio of competition to your likelihood there is very uh, unfavorable. I think it makes a lot more sense to start with what you have experience in and then just inch your way into analytics. And if you desire it to data science or to SQL programming as an example, um, just because people always want to connect the dots between who you are and what experiences you have relative to what problems you can solve for them. Awesome. Um, so question from JJ. I did my bachelor's in computer science and then a postgraduate diploma in big data analytics. I'm good at SQL, Python, and Power BI, plus a certification in Tableau Desktop. I'm unable to land a job, uh, my first job in this field. What should I do? Well, um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. And I, obviously, you have a great pedigree of, of technical background there. Like, companies need those, those roles. Um, one thing is uh, big data is starting to be a four level word in our industry. And I might be going down the wrong rabbit hole here, 
But um, Hadoop was really, really big um, a couple of years ago. And you didn't mention Hadoop in, in the skills that you have. So I'm not, not trying to apply that. But to a lot of companies, when they hear big data, they're going to think Hadoop. And they're going to think, oh, I, as a company, just spent $2 million on this tool that we only use for four years. And then now we've migrated to, to uh, Snowflake. Now, I'm not saying like hide that part. Like if your diploma was big data analytics, like 99.9% .9 of those skills are gonna tra uh, 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 transition. But I guess my recommendation there is just make sure that it is very, very clear that the, the technical skills that you have are related to the tools that are likely being used at say that company that you're applying. Yeah, maybe they have legacy tools, then you can talk about how you have that experience, but do the research ahead of time. Like if they use Oracle, know that they use Oracle. If they use Microsoft SQL Server, know they use Microsoft SQL Server. Like you can, you can find or infer this information a lot of times, particularly at larger companies, or you can ask within your first interview so you can do a little bit more research about how those tools work before you move on to your more technical interviews down the road. Um, the other thing that is really important in interviews, particularly when I interview people, is if they're on my desk and they're in a final interview, I never ask them about technical things. I only ask them about the quote unquote soft skills. And I hate that term. I've never found a better term because they're so important. They're not soft to me, but communication is super important. Project management is super important. Um, dealing with change. So change management is super important in these spaces. Highlighting those skills is usually what's going to set someone apart when I'm interviewing them than anything else. Because if you're getting the first interview, getting to the second or third interview, you probably have those technical chops because that's the easiest thing to evaluate. And that's how they can uh, eliminate people earlier on, or even just pick which resumes turn into interviews, kind of focusing on those soft skills tends to be the most important thing from my experience. Um, anything you would add, Michael? Yeah, that was a great summary. And I think I would also say here, um, JJ, you know, when you, so the programs that exist today, great for training people technically, excellent, but there's a misconception, I think, that a lot of, especially new grads, but even mid-career people who are taking these certifications, they think that if they list a bunch of tools that they know how to use, that that'll attract employers. And I've looked at a lot of resumes, I've interviewed a lot of people, and I usually start to turn a blind eye when I see a resume just littered with lots of different certifications and tools that people can use. I'm like, well, where do they focus their time? They can't possibly be like expert level in 20 different tools, right? So what I would say is this, number one, it's never bad to have these skills. You've done an excellent job learning these tools and these skills. And I bet over the course of the next few years, you're going to use all of them or most of them. But what you want to communicate now as you're trying to find your job, you want to narrow down what kind of job do I want and start connecting with those companies and people that are hiring for that kind of job. And then your task is whether it's applying through an online portal or whether it's asking someone for a referral directly through LinkedIn or whatever. Um, if you can convince someone that you can solve the kinds of problems that they encounter. So let me give you an example. Maybe you have learned all these different tools, right? I I'm sure you have, but maybe for this particular company, all they really need is someone who's really good with SQL. So what you can do is actually produce one, two, maybe three personal projects, something that you're interested in that's related to the industry that you want to work in that prove that you know SQL well and that you can solve a problem similar to what the hiring manager in that industry or company would probably be seeing. When someone can connect the dots and say, hey, this is a real person, they can solve a real problem, they kind of understand me what problems I need to solve, what kind of tools I care about, what kind of uh, industry I'm in. If, if someone can connect with us and say, hey, a real person really interested in me and what I'm dealing with here in this company, in this industry, then it doesn't matter if you know 10 tools, as long as you can demonstrate that you can solve two or three main types of problems that are relevant to that hiring manager, it's a huge win. So I would say the gap here is narrow down to ex maybe a very small list of roles that you would like at certain companies, connect with all the people from those companies on LinkedIn that you possibly can, and then start talking to them about, hey, what kind of tools do you use at your company? What kind of problems do you solve? And maybe even do a quick one, two, three hour project where you demonstrate, hey, I used 
Python to solve X problem. And I think if you get a couple of those that you can just talk about them, you don't even have to show a portfolio, but you just talk about them as you're having conversations or in an interview. I think that'll go a long way for you. Yeah, so two things that build off there. Uh, I'm glad you brought up a lot of those points, Michael. Um, the first thing is have a portfolio. Like that is, I do not hire people nowadays who do not have some form of a portfolio. Like I have to be able to see that they have applicable um, biz, uh, business use cases that they can talk about. Now, you can't share what you do at other companies, but you can replicate what you did on a sample data set that you get from a website like Kaggle. It's, it's worth doing that. So having things out on GitHub, having things out on Alteryx Gallery, out on Tableau Public, Microsoft's version of it, which I'm blanking on its name, um, is super important. Now, I want to talk um, a little bit more about um, what, what Michael was saying about getting to know people and, and referrals. For better or worse, most hires, at least at small companies and medium companies, from my personal experience, I think it would be different for large enterprise companies just based on a volume. But at small and medium companies, the majority of the hires are going to be a referral. So maybe it, and I don't mean like it's a friend, like, you know, the person in the community, like when we hired Michael, we knew him from LinkedIn. Um, and I can say I knew the Tableau public profiles or the LinkedIn presence or the YouTube presence of 60 to 80% of our hires that we have before, before we did that. Now, to be fair, like, here at, at Tessellation Data Coach, we, we are very insistent on, on hiring people who are thought leaders or who we think can become thought leaders. So I do think we skew towards the more extreme end of this. But I, I think that, uh, that advice is valid. Like you're much more likely to get hired at any organization if the people know who you are or at the very least know you by reputation. Mm. And I think there's a great point here. So this can take many forms. It doesn't have to be, but it can be Tableau Public Profile, Alteryx. It could be a GitHub. It could just be you've worked on certain projects or use cases, either in a professional setting or on your own, and you list them on your LinkedIn. Or maybe once in a while, you write a post on LinkedIn detailing one of the projects you've recently done. The goal is to somehow both connect with the right people that want to hire you, even if you didn't know them before, at least connect with them, have a genuine conversation with them. And in that conversation, weave in some proof that, hey, you are the type of person that they would like to work with. And as long as they've got a, at least a general awareness of who you are, what you can do, you don't have to pitch super hard to them, but just getting to know those people um, I think is a much better reward for your for your labor than I mean it, it is also useful to sp kind of spray your resumes out there on the online platforms but I think you have a lot lower rate of return of actual interviews so I would say do both um, but ultimately if you can showcase hey this is who I am as a person this is what I can do without having to really pitch yourself as soon as you meet the person in an interview um, I think it'll go a long way for you there so you mentioned resumes Michael I have to say this I hate reading resumes. Yes. And the reason I hate reading resumes is nine out of 10 resumes seem to be identical to me. They use the exact same format for Microsoft Word and they say the exact same things and I don't actually learn anything about the person. I am much more likely before I interview someone to look at their LinkedIn, to look at their, their, uh, their social feeds, to look at their... Mm. Um, Tableau Public, their, their Alteryx Gallery, their GitHub, than I am to actually read through the resume. Like when I look at the resume, I'm probably looking at, um, uh, honestly, I'm probably looking to see if I knew what college they went to, not because I care what college they went to, just because it was a college I know, it's just something I can talk about. Um, like they're, they're a necessary evil and you have to have them and you have to have them up to date, particularly at large companies. It's, it's a requirement, but don't put too much value or stock into it. it it's worth building up those other areas um, more and spending more time on those than it is just on a single piece of paper and stop having them be so long. Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> um, it, they need to be shorter. All right, I could talk about that for, for hours. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Can I just add one quick thing, two quick things? Okay, first of all, think of the situation in which someone's gonna read your resume, okay? Situation one, 
they're digging through an online portal of applicants because they don't have anyone giving them referrals. So they're going ahead and digging through and you're looking at hundreds at a time. It's not the best time to meet somebody. Okay. The other situation is maybe you've reached out to them on LinkedIn or someone has referred you and they're actually taking the time to go in and dig into your resume. Okay. There's a lot of things that have to happen. They have to decide, oh, this person, it's worth my time to look in detail at their experience. So I'm just saying, just as Alex is saying, with a grain of salt, realize that your resume can be a tool, but there's already some things that have to happen before someone ever sees it. That being said, what I highly recommend, there's somebody that writes for Forbes. Her name is Liz Ryan. She's a HR professional, has been for decades. She recommends using something called a human voice resume. Instead of bullet points, listing off all your tools that you're good at, instead, write a few paragraphs, maybe a paragraph for this job and a paragraph for that job. And it basically explains why were you at this company? What did you accomplish? How did you do it? Uh, really the results and highlights of your career experience in regular human voice. And I think that goes a long way to helping people not hate your resume as another cookie cutter format, just as Alex is mentioning here. Yeah, one final thing, like I said, I could probably talk about this for hours. Um, one thing that we've been experimenting with here with good success has been uh, video applications. And I don't, I wouldn't go so bold as to send someone an unsolicited video application. But if you have something talking about yourself on your blog, there's a good chance that the hiring manager or the people interviewing you will watch that beforehand. And that's much more interesting to me. Um, our, our relatively new um, head of HR here she did that. She sent us a, uh, I forget if it was solicited or unsolicited, mm -hmm. um, video application, and it just set her apart. And we we're like, yep, we watched that. We knew we were going to hire her in a heartbeat. All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, Giselle, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. I have my master's in ECE, and all my projects are related to AI applications for medical images or text, right from my undergrad. But these projects are part of academia, of which two of them are done in collaboration with healthcare systems. Am I being overconfident to apply for data scientist roles and in brackets, healthcare systems? So presumably within healthcare systems. I have some strong feelings about this. Um, I don't personally work in um, AI and, and, and medical imaging and text, but I do have family members who do, and I talk to them about this all the time. I think the AI and the ML trend is, and there's going to be a caveat, so, so stay with me, trend is a little overblown. And what I mean by that is most companies, and to some extent, even the Apples, the Amazons, the Facebooks of the world, aren't really ready to apply some of the AI and the ML um, algorithms that, that they think will change their business, and they could th theoretically change their business. And the reason usually has to do with... Um, uh, uh, things like have they collected enough data, how's the quality of the data, all that sort of thing. I would say one of the biggest exceptions to that within the AI field is medical imaging. Um, there is such a need for that right now. And particularly, this has been uh, really escalated by COVID. A lot of small companies have started up in the last 18 months that do exactly this. They they partner with either academic institutions or medical systems or both, and they help to do that processing. So if the group's unfamiliar, it could be um, some examples that I've seen demoed are uh, instead of having a radiologist look at every single cancer screening x-ray or, or whatever, um, they'll have an AI machine do it first. And they've seen that in some cases, at least in, in a laboratory setting, like the radiologist might be 90% effective, but the, the AI machine might be 96% effective. Those are rough numbers. I remember reading something kind of like that. So it's a booming field. Um, when COVID started, uh, there was also a lot of people focusing in this field uh, to do things like real-time medical imaging with like uh, thermal cameras, like who's walking into your hospital with, with fevers and uh, trying to isolate those people because they might have COVID and they might transfer it. Anyway, this is just a personal interest of mine. I'm not an expert in this field, but I find it fascinating. I do think it is, uh, from what I have seen, it is a booming industry um, specifically. So I guess my thing is like, I don't think you're overconfident because this is the one area in AI 
that I don't think they can find enough people for. Well said. And in fact, I want to add something. And by the way, Mitch, another person from our team here at Tessellation added a great comment uh, to address this as well. Focus on the business side of things, focus on the impact. So let me just back up a second. Your original question was, am I being overconfident to apply to data scientist or senior data scientist roles in healthcare? And I would say not necessarily. You've got a lot going for you, right? You've got multiple engagements where you've actually worked with the healthcare system to solve real problems. I, it was either through internships or jobs uh, before your master's. I don't know exactly, but, but that's really big. If you've got actual engagements with healthcare systems, huge. Um, if you've actually worked on that particular application, huge. As Alex did mention, there's a lot of demand for it. What I will say, having been on the data robot you know, uh, solutions team, where we were basically at a blazingly fast pace, implementing machine learning models, even some of them were uh, uh, visual uh, you know, AI uh, problems, you can do it quick with, with the software out there, right? What I was trying to say, though, is um, people would come with really clean data, really perfect data, and a very well-posed problem. And then, yeah, we can go ahead and solve that problem. Think of all the stuff that has to happen before you actually get to the point where you've got clean data, a well-posed problem. What I would say is in order to ensure your job security and your marketability long-term is sure, go for some of those jobs that are very narrowly focused on, let's say, uh, AI for, for image recognition, for example. Go for it, but also make sure you're keeping grasp of, well, in order for someone to solve this kind of problem, we have got to have this kind of data. It's got to be clean. It's got to be automated. Uh, there's got to be a business application that we're actually solving for in order to reduce the risk of failure of that project, you could technically solve the problem, but it could still fail. Look at all the surrounding stuff, both technically and from a business perspective. And just as Mitch was saying here on the on the comment, like look up, look at what are the actual uh, practical problems you're solving that have real business or health value and focus your efforts on proving that you can solve those problems too. And I think you can't go wrong. So I, I want to build on that because Mitch brings up an excellent point. I was actually chatting about six months ago with an owner of a startup that does uh, video and image uh, AI within healthcare systems. And I was chatting with him and really the thing to remember in the big difference between what people tend to do in academia and what people do in, in business. Um, and I think this applies across fields. It's not just medicine, it's not just AI. This also applies for analysts is how does this help the bottom line of a company? Hmm those are going to be the problems that um, uh, businesses want to know that are being solved. And it, it, it's a harsh reality. Like, like we love to focus on things that help people, but at the end of the day, you're getting hired by a business. And unless it's a nonprofit, its goal is probably to make money. So to Mitch's point, like instead of saying just, I mean, obviously, um, in healthcare, you want people to get better because if they don't get better, they're not going to come back and use your services again. But like, how are you being more efficient? How are you keeping down costs? How are you uh, uh, making sure that a doctor or a nurse can see more patients in a day? Those are the kind of use cases that will really grab someone's attention when they're reading, uh, uh, reading a resume or your LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say something. I see that most of our uh, questions we've answered so far. I did want to say something related to the topic of, so you, you want to prepare for that job. Maybe it's healthcare, maybe it's something else. We've talked about what to upskill in, you know, how to pick something that will be relevant to you in the future. But I want to just say a brief something about when you are preparing for your long-term data career, how do you balance upskilling with your full-time role? right? Because the fact is many people have a full-time job when they decide they want to get into data. Sometimes it's a big career pivot, right? You've got to learn things. You've got to take courses. You've got to build stuff, make a portfolio, apply to new jobs, sometimes dozens, maybe hundreds of jobs, depends on your field. I would just say you've got to have this perspective of, of a balance long-term and that for a brief time, it's going to be all personal effort. You're going to have to somehow find a way uh, as you're doing your full-time role to incorporate little learning experiences into your job. For example, solve a data automation or machine learning problem in your role today, even if it's not super relevant, just do it. 
or on your own personal time, build a project. But thankfully, as you start to transition into a full-time role, now all your learning experiences are coming during your day job, right? So I think you've got to have this mindset also of like patience and balance where yes, for a time, it will be kind of a little bit of front end work. But uh, over time, as you get more and more, you take those stepping stone roles, you get closer and closer to your long-term goal. Um, it's going to be easier and easier to just align your learning experiences with your full-time role. I think that's the goal. And actually, that is why we love Data Coach so much. It's a program where we actually have people in a full-time role learning how to use these new tools and apply it to their jobs. So that's a quick, shameless plug there. One thing I love about the upskilling journey is that if you do it right, you can actually pick experiences um, that align well with what you're doing today that'll serve you well tomorrow. Uh, were you going to say something, Alex? Yeah, I wanted to build off one of the points you, you have there. Um, one thing that that I don't like in interviews that comes up, I'd say in every third interview is when people apply to the job and they, how do I wanna say this? And they're like, oh, I want to apply to the job within data analytics because it is, I don't have that much experience in data analytics and I wanna get more experience in data analytics. The first thing that I think when I hear that is, okay, why haven't you taken the time to actually do this beforehand? Like if this is something you're truly passionate about, no one, is going to hand this opportunity to you to learn these mm. tools. You need to take initiative to learn the tools, learn the concepts, be self-reflective and create a portfolio. That's, that's not, that's no one's responsibility, but your own. Hopefully I'm explaining that well, but that's, oh yeah, that is um, self-accountability in, in learning is a big thing. Like, um, and look for those opportunities. And don't be afraid to double dip. What I mean is use opportunities in your job or as you're going about things that you enjoy in life and make them learning opportunities in data. Um, there was a time where it was not required at all. No one asked me to do this, but in my engineering role at Michelin, I just decided to prove a point that this particular design element was going to work in production. I made a regression model, okay? I didn't need to do it, but I just wanted to get practice with regression. Sure enough, that helped me in my next interview for my next role. And I think what you're saying, Alex, is you've got to balance, yes, everyone's going to be busy. Everyone's going to have competing priorities. It may take you months or years as opposed to weeks or months to make the transition to where you're actually trying to go. Um, but what I will say is this, there's so many opportunities to double dip and really uh, get learning opportunities right where you are and just start taking those baby steps. Over time, that consistency pays off. And months or years from now, you're going to look back and say, wow, I have really come far. I've come to exactly where I wanted to be. And all it took was consistent effort a little bit at a time to proactively manage my own career, set myself up for the upskilling that I need to do to ultimately get that job that I wanted. So uh, we're coming close to the hour. Uh, we've gone through all of the questions that have been in the Q&A functionality. We probably have time for one more uh, via that if someone wants to quickly type mm. the type of question they still have. Um, but while we wait for that, I'm going to ask you another question, Michael. Um, what's one thing that you still struggle with? Absolutely. And by the way, uh, I see Kakab that you have uh, your hand raised. Please feel free to uh, type your uh, chat question. I'm not sure that it'll let us uh, turn on your audio, but certainly type your question. We'll try to answer it. Great question, Alex. And I think it's evolved over the last few years. What is my struggle? Well, I think if you know, if you've seen anything I've written in, in, on LinkedIn over the past couple of years, my struggle started with I don't belong here in the data world. I'm an outsider. Who's going to hire me? Who's going to trust me to do their projects, right? And, and what I found was everybody belongs here. If you want to work in data, you have a place here. It just comes to the fact that you have to prove to other people that you actually are authentically caring about working on data problems, that, that you can do it. And so there's a little bit of a front end work to do a portfolio product or meet people and tell them what you're about to be able to set yourself up as maybe a thought leader or as somebody who's actively involved in the data community. So the first year, couple of years, it was, hey, I don't feel like I belong here. I think that's faded. I think, I think now it's, hey, how can I help other people realize too that they belong here? I have so many friends. I have so many people that I talk to as part of my data coach role or reviewing resumes. People that I see are still struggling with that same thing. I don't feel like I can get traction. I don't think that I belong here. And, and my goal, my vision is, hey, I want a lot of people to realize this is yours for the taking. 
All you got to do is focus a little bit on, hey, don't try to do everything, right? In a balanced way, in a patient and long-term strategic way, how can you set yourself up to meet the right people, do the right kinds of projects, learn the right kinds of skills, and repeat. And what I'm finding is it's not a one and done. It's not a binary thing where you're here, now you're here. It's actually this iterative cycle that continues to build over time. Kind of like, bad analogy, Pokemon Go, okay? So you're playing Pokemon Go. You think, oh, I'm going to go to the grocery store. But if I take this scenic route, I can go get another Pokemon, right? It was that silly virtual reality game. Loved seeing my friends play that game. And you go throughout life and you grab this thing and that thing, this skill, this experience, that company that you work with, that mentor. And then over time you see, oh, we've built this cool data career. And I think that's the thing is the struggle is, hey, how do I know when I belong? How do I know when I have arrived? I think to some extent you just realize after a while of doing this that, hey, everybody belongs here. If you take the initiative and, and put yourself out there. I think I see another question here. Yeah. So, uh... Kokab has asked, can I communicate with you LinkedIn? I'm LinkedIn, Michael. Yes, please do. Send me a connection invite. Send me a message. Happy to talk with you. All right. And then uh, Rishi asked, will it be possible to get some comments on my LinkedIn profile? I've been working as a research intern, but it's going to end soon. Hence, was looking for changes uh, mm. to solve these challenges. Um, as much as I would love to do that, Rishi, and I would actually find it really enjoyable, there's just not enough hours in the day. Um, what I would recommend is just uh, go to some friends, some professional mentors, and just say, what are your objectives? Like, what are the two, three, four things you want someone to know about you before you leave, um, mm -hmm. before they leave your LinkedIn page, and then have them look at the page? Or even better yet, say, to someone who hasn't seen your LinkedIn page before. I bet your best friend hasn't seen your LinkedIn page before, like your friends, you're not coworkers. Um, say, what are the top things that you come away with this? One thing that I did that I think is super helpful is um, I took a, I paid for a short uh, course on Skillshare mm. or how to make LinkedIn pages. It was one of the best couple dollars I've ever spent. It was, it was really, really good insight. And it wasn't specific to data and analytics either. It was just some really good input out there. Cool. I do want to say some closing comments here. And by the way, um, if you sent me a, a connection invitation before and I haven't answered it, one way is if you can just comment on one of my posts, I'll then be able to check out your profile and see your invitation. Um, but definitely I wanted to close with this. Everybody here, if you want a career in data, I just want you to know it is very possible. I'm very thankful for the experiences that Alex and the team have given me and others at Tessellation, and it's been a great ride. And what I'll say is if you can just break it down to a couple of practical steps, people to connect with, skills to learn, projects to do, experiences to gain, then this can be yours. Uh, you can really enjoy working in data for a very long time. Uh, it's yours for the taking. So again, very happy to talk with you today. Alex, any closing comments as well? No, I just, uh, I really appreciate everyone attending here today. Um, I'm really happy that we only had to go through two of our stock questions and the group was was very uh, involved. And I think I can speak for both myself and Michael and say, this is one of the, the more fun webinars we've done. So hopefully it was for y'all as well. Thank you, appreciate everybody. Thanks. And have a great, uh, have a great week.